Good morning. morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church today for this time of worship as it is every Sunday. No matter where we meet, it's a wonderful time and opportunity to to gather together as the family of God and to worship His holy name. And so I'm so glad that you're here this morning. I want to welcome those who might be visiting us. We are so glad that you're visiting as well. If you are a visitor and want the church to contact you, please note that a portion of your bulletin does tear out and you can put your contact information there and, um, and let me know that you'd like uh, us to reach out and we'll do that this week. Additionally, if you ever have a change in address, a change of email address, phone number, and you want to communicate that to the church, please fill out one of those as well and um, we'll know when we see that coming in um, that that is what that is. Um, and uh, so we appreciate that. I want to welcome also our online um, uh, congregation this morning. We are glad that you are here and are, are gathered for worship. Um, if you are online, I would like to encourage you to say hello in the comment section so we can get a sense of the community that is gathered there. And we are glad, again, that you are here. I want to say a huge thank you to the members of our congregation who participated in the Dogwood Ministry, uh, Dogwood Festival Ministry last weekend. Um, I, I, I continue to hear um, every year uh, that, that, we've, that I've been here, the two years I've been here, just uh, praise reports of, of the ways that uh, people who work uh, for the festival uh, are blessed by that ministry. And, and not only this, but it's, it's, there's also other people um, at other churches who reach out to find out you know, exactly what we're doing and because they hear it's a blessing and they want to be able to bless others. So a huge thank you to Elaine Craft for your leadership there. Thank you to, to your close team there that, that, that are, are it's, it's like everywhere. You know, you got a team and a leader, and then you got a little bit of a, a more committed team, and then you got those who are out there that are helping in various ways. So thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone for all the ways that you have given of yourself to that. Um, as far as announcements go this morning, uh, you will notice, uh, you, you probably saw it in the, the newsletter that came out this past week, and you also see it there right below the order of worship. We are, for the month of May, doing a special love offering for Brian and for Holly, and um, we uh, are, are, uh, have been in this journey together, and, um, and we, as the deacons, we've been talking for a while about when the appropriate time was to do this that we wanted to do, and so now is, is the time, and we're excited to come around them and, and to help uh, with this love offering. So if you have any questions about that, you can ask, uh, one, uh, ask me or, or ask Judith McCoy, who's the chair of our deacons, and uh, we will be glad to, to help. Um, but make sure when you do give to that, you designate it love offering for Brian and Holly. Um, there is a deacons meeting this evening at 7 p.m. There's also a trustees meeting on Tuesday, May 9th at 7 p.m. At this time, I'd like to invite you to join your hearts with me in prayer as we begin this time of worship. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise and glory for being the God of creation, for being the God who is good, for being the God who loves. And you showed that love in giving your son Jesus to us. We thank you for Jesus, for him being the sacrifice uh, that, that, brought us, uh, that brought us into right relationship with you. We thank you for your spirit that dwells in us and that guides us and that brings us together in times like this to worship you. God, we pray that today as we give you honor and glory, that, you would, that it would be pleasing to you. It's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. morning. This morning I will be reading from Psalms 31, 1 through 5, and 15 and 16. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock or refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me 
from the heads of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let, me, let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our, and now I invite you to stand as we sing our song of praise, Famous for.
As we enter into a time of prayer now, I want to direct you to the prayer list that is listed um, on the back of our bulletin. And I want to ask you if you would to, uh, if you have something to write with, you can add it there. Um, and if not, just plant this person in your heart and their family. Um, uh, Angie Evans uh, shared with me this morning that Henry Mills passed uh, today. And he's the father of Valinda Moore, who is uh, her best friend. And so we want to be praying for the Mills family and the Moores and, um, and their extended family uh, in the, today and in the days ahead. So this time as we do pray, um, I want to give us all an opportunity to lift up people on the prayer list uh, in our hearts where we're sitting. And so uh, for the next uh, minute or so, uh, let us pray and then I will conclude with the pastoral prayer. God, we thank you for the peace of this moment and this place. We're able to gather together again and to seek you and, and to lift up brothers and sisters um, uh, from our church, from neighboring communities, uh, within our community. Uh, Lord, we know that there are uh, many who are going through tough things, many who are um, going through the loss of loved ones, many dealing with tough diagnosis, others who have... Um, infirmities that have been ongoing and um, there's just a lot of places that we come from as we gather this morning and as we seek you and as we lift up an intercessory prayer for those who are on our list and those who we hold in our hearts. God, we do pray for your healing. We pray for your healing powers among those who need it. We pray for your comfort for those who grieve. We pray for your peace for all of us. We all, we all need it. And it's a gift that you give to us. God, continue to show us how we can be your hands and feet among people in our congregation, among those in our families, among those that we work with and know in this community. God, we pray that we would continue to see your work being done among our churches uh, and, and, and the ways that you, um, you are continuing to further your kingdom. We give you thanks that that as we gather as your body and as your family, that we are the people that you have called to reach a hurting world with the good news of Jesus. So God, give us courage in that task. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you again to stand and to worship and to declare the goodness of God. <coughs>
go ahead and say a thank you for the love offering. I had no idea anything about it until I read it in the bulletin this morning. Um, so it was a very blessed surprise. So thank you ahead of time and more thanks will come because we're very blessed to be part of this church during this time. Um, I cannot imagine again being anywhere else. So thank you ahead of that for all of that. Um, so today our... Um, I am going to share before we read the scripture one other thing that I found out today this morning. I got a message from my sister-in-law. My youngest niece was saved this morning. So, so yes, yeah, so today is a day full of blessings, and Brian is doing great. So um, today is definitely a day of blessings. So take that with you guys today. So now our scripture, our New Testament reading is coming from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 10, 2 through 10. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. You are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He's re- he was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priest. That through the meditation of Jesus Christ, you offer, spiritual, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize honor, the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that builds, builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word, and so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you had no identity as a people, Now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Praise his holy name. Now if I can have all my kids come down. Good morning. Turn in. Yep, big test too. We'll take them all. We will take them all. First, do you know what a parable is? You don't know what it is? Parable is a story that often has a lesson behind it. And Jesus is very good at using parables to teach lessons. And Pastor Graham's going to preach on one of those parables today. I cannot talk this morning, y'all. Um, So Pastor Graham's going to preach on one of those. So I'm going to read you part of it this morning. Can I do that? Can I do that, Lillian? Are we good? Okay. So it says, As Jesus traveled around the countryside with his disciples, large crowds often gathered around him to hear him teach. He often taught them using parables. This parable is called the parable of the sower. And here it goes. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he scattered the seed, some of, the, some of it fell on a hard path nearby, and the birds came and ate it up real quick. As the farmer continued to plant the seeds, some of them fell on soil that was full of rocks. There was not much dirt around the rocks at all. So when the seeds started to sprout and grow, they quickly died because the weather came through. There was no roots. They couldn't grow down deep. There is so little dirt that they couldn't get there. In the afternoon, the sun was hot, and that caused the plants to die. Some of the other seeds fell on the soil that had been taken over by weeds. Well, the weeds quickly outgrew the seeds and choked the seeds out. Finally, some fell on the good soil that had been plowed. It had been fertilized. It had been given good food for the seeds to grow. Those seeds flourished 
and thrived. They grew into beautiful plants and produced good fruit. Now, the lesson that Jesus was trying to show, do you have any idea what Jesus was trying to teach with that lesson? Keep going. Okay, he's, he, he's tried. The different types of soil represents us, our hearts. Where is our heart when we hear about God? And when we go upstairs, we'll kind of break it down a little bit more. But is our heart hard? So we hear the message, but we don't, we let it kind of not even go in. It just kind of falls off. Or if there's so much going in, it's kind of rocky and we're angry all the time that it, it, we hear it, but we don't let it do anything. It quickly dies away. Or if we're stuck in the weeds, so to speak, and we've got so much else going on that our worries overtake the word that we hear, the message of God that we hear, or our hearts wide open. So when we hear the word of God, we live it. Where are our hearts? Where are our hearts? That's what we got to figure out. We want to be the good, open hearts, full of rich soil. So when we hear God's word, it thrives in us. And what do we do? Do we keep it with us? Do we keep God's word inside of us? What else do we do? Do we send it out? Mm -hmm. We tell people. So we want to be the good heart, okay, the good soil. That when we hear God's word, we take it into our heart, okay? Let's pray. Creator God, thank you so much for all that you have done. Thank you for your word and your son. Help us to have our hearts opened and be receptive of all your teachings and all your love that you have to give. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Um, at this time, as the choir is, is uh, returning to sit with the congregation, I would like to invite you to stand up and say hello to the folks around you. When the music comes to an end, that's a sign to get back to your pew. Before I jump in this morning, I just want to say a word of thank you to, um, to all of those who are part of the music ministry here at First Baptist Church. We are so blessed, Johnny, by you. <laughs> Catherine, Catherine's, Catherine, by you. By our, those who work up behind the scenes in the booth every Sunday. <laughs> Christy and, and our acclaim group. Our choir and our and our children. You, we have our children and our youth who have been involved in our music ministry. So big thank you to Beth and and you know Holly's not in here right now to receive a, a thanks, but they uh, encourage our youth and our children to be part um, of it. I've just just been thinking lately just how blessed we are to have the diversity, and I, you know, you've heard me talk about it before, there, there, our strength is in our diversity, and our diversity is a beautiful thing. We worship in, in slightly different ways, and I say slightly, for some they may say, oh, that's a real big difference from song to song, but it's, it's slightly different. It's slightly different. 99% of it is aimed directly at Jesus, and that, well, 100% of it is aimed at Jesus, right? Amen? Amen? I remember... Um, there is a, I remember someone telling me, all songs, all songs directed for the Lord are hymns. All right, what did you say? You, say? you got a word? Oh, no, well, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So this morning, I'm excited to start, and I need, I need something, and I'll talk to you a little bit while I'm, I'm very depleted on energy this morning, and hopefully it'll tie in a little bit uh, towards the conclusion side of this sermon, but I'm excited to jump into Matthew chapter 13 this morning. I've been praying about what might come next, and in this time between Easter and, uh, and as we move into the, sum, to the summer and we're going to Pentecost Sunday, the day that we uh, remember and celebrate the Holy Spirit's work among us 
um, I've been drawn to some of these passages of Scripture where Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God is like. And if you look in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, there are these kingdom parables. And every single one of these parables have to do with agriculture. If you look, you'll see the parable of the sower, the parable of the weeds, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the hidden treasure. That has a little bit to do with farming. We'll get there. And then the parable of the net. You see, all civilizations at this time, at the time that Jesus uh, was, came to earth um, on this mission to save us, uh, all civilizations um, at this time in history knew that agriculture was an integral part of their society. They didn't just go to the food line and pick things off of a shelf that are watered on a timer and, and kept fresh, and when they, they, they get spoiled, hopefully they're pulled off and replaced with something that is fresh. They knew that there was a lot more work involved. Animals needed to be grown. Plants had to be planted. Fish had to be caught. And so this agrarian community understood very well these parables that Jesus was teaching. And so this morning, I want us to read the first uh, that comes in this section, the parable of the sower. And so if you have a copy of the Word of God, again, we're in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13. And if not, the Scriptures will be on the screen. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around Him that He got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have in abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will, ever, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they, do not, since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In this parable, Jesus tells the story of the sower or the farmer who comes 
in the spring to plant seeds. And the seeds fall on different soil conditions, don't they? You heard Holly mention it just a few minutes ago, that the, the first place that the seed falls on is on the path. The path is hard, it's beaten down, and as a result, the seed stands no chance. The birds, I imagine pigeons, come along looking for something to eat and peck it right up, right? After all, the Lord has to provide for the birds. Amen? You know, this represents the hard-heartedness, the callous hearts. The people that Jesus was speaking to knew about calloused hearts. They knew that when someone hardened their heart against the Lord, that bad things happened in their lives. That they weren't able to live out into the vision that God had for their lives. You know, we all from time to time have hard hearts, don't we? There's baggage that we carry. There are things that happen in our lives that keep us from opening up and allowing God in. Or keep us from opening up around brothers and sisters and allowing us to be in community with the people we're called to be in community with. We all know the path very well. The next soil condition that the seed falls along is rocky places in the soil. These seeds fall and they find a little bit of soil mixed in among the rocks. And pretty soon a little bit of a root comes out. It's called it was it germination. Is that what happens? You know, y'all know I went to NC State and majored in poultry science. I paid more attention to poultry science a little bit and then some other college, you know, anyway, it was my prodigal son years, okay? But ger- I know the word germination, amen? Okay, so germination, germinates. The little, little bitty root comes down, you get a little, fl- uh, little um, plant that pops up a little bit, and it looks good for the, for the moment, right? Recently, we decided to start a garden way back in March, okay? We were going to start a garden, so we bought the little... You know the little tray? Because, you know, in March it's cold. And so we bought a little tray, and it has a little, little pot. What do they call pods that you put in there? Little pods, soil pods. You're supposed to dump the water in it, and, they, and they, they expand a little bit, and then you put a little seed in there, and then you put the little tray thing on it. It's like a little greenhouse. And so a month later, we, a month and a half later, we remembered we had these, and, uh, which was last week. And so we started our garden last week, <laughs> literally last week. And, um, and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to put the little seed into the thing. And then, and then uh, uh, cucumbers, by the way, if you want to do this with your children, cucumbers are like two days, bam, they're up, okay? But then they start overgrowing the tray. And pretty soon you need to take them outside. But the problem we found with the cucumbers is that they didn't have enough of a root system. So we put them outside, we planted them, and like, bam, the sun came along, scorched them, and killed them. Right? That happens, right? So if you go by our house today, you'll look over... To the right side, there's a rose bush, and you look, there's a bunch of stuff kind of sitting in the shade over there, and we're trying to restart some things. Anyway, we'll see what happens. This, this is going to be an experiment uh, this coming late spring and into the summer. We'll see if we have anything to eat coming from the yard. But the rocky places, we know the rocky places well. We know those places in our lives, um, the, the old habits and the routines that keep us from growing spiritually, Right? We know it's, it's much easier to, to tune into Netflix or, or uh, Amazon Prime or, or Disney Plus and watch a whole season of something than to sit still for five minutes and pray, don't we? It's, easier, it's much easier to spend, to spend four hours binge-watching television than five minutes with the Lord. We, we know that they're different, though, right? But those rocks, those rocks of routines, those rocks of old habits, they're hard to pull out of that soil. Another soil condition was mentioned by Jesus. The soil that has thorns or weeds. Those of you who try to grow grass, right, Ronnie? We know about some weeds. The weeds will grow up and they'll choke your grass out. And, um, and, and uh, there's a guy who told me recently, he said, you want, your, you want your weeds to be competing with your grass and not your grass to be competing with your weeds. Anybody heard that one before? So, so, uh, so, so thorns, weeds... You know, imagine the, the seed falls into this soil condition and it, it gets started, but as it tries to grow, it can't get any nutrients. It can't get anything in there. The, the scriptures say in verse uh, 22 here, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. Okay, 
That's purposely said by Jesus, the deceitfulness of wealth. Every one of you, if you were offered a, a promotion in your job tomorrow to make 25% more than what you do, or your retirement, or whatever, your check's going to be 25 how many of y'all are going to say yes to that? Yeah. But isn't it true, the more you make, the more you spend, Right? Those of you who've been around the sun a few more times than me, I'm sure you've seen that well over your years. Just as Gina and I have these conversations all the time, just because you make more money doesn't mean make you any more wise with what you do with your money. You just waste more if you don't have instilled in you these values beforehand, these values of what you're going to do with your money, of saving your money, of using it for good and not selfishness. So this seed falling among the thorns... First, these people who, who hear the Word of God, it starts springing up with all, all of these other weeds in the life. And we're going to talk a little more, more about weed, um, weeds in the next sermon. Um, the, the next parable is going to be next week, okay? We might call it like something like how to smoke your weed or how to burn it. I don't know. I'm, I'm still figuring this out, okay? So share, somebody, share with somebody that the pastor might really put his foot in his mouth on Mother's Day, and they need to come and see this. Okay, um, and it, it's better to see live than later on, on online. <clears throat> we'll figure it out though. But we got to deal with the weeds in our life. I see Bobby standing up. Am I? Am I? Am I getting? Are you making y'all nervous from the back? Okay. Uh, <laughs> the weeds in the life—they come and they choke out. They choke out the things in the place where God wants to bring the growth. And I think we know we know about those things in our lives, right? We know about those things that don't start out evil. And I talk about it all the time because I experience that all the time. Gina and I, talk, we, I have to have a therapy session weekly from my wife about how my hobbies don't matter. Okay? <laughs> I played nine holes of golf this past week and shot a 42, and I was so excited. But it didn't make me a better husband. It didn't make me a better father. It didn't make me a better preacher. It just gave me a little, maybe one little good story. But that was about it. When my pigeons come home fast, it doesn't... It doesn't it doesn't increase me in those other areas of life. When I hunt, and one day, Rick, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot a deer that I can mount and put on my wall. Okay, one day I'm going to do that. All right, hadn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. But that's not going to make me, it's not going to make all these other things fit into place. But there is the promise that if I spend my life pursuing those things and not God, that those things will choke out what God wants to do in me. Have you, ever, have you ever planted some stuff, and, or, or maybe, you, maybe you bought a couple plants, a couple of, what's a, what's a, what's a bush or something like a, no, like a flower? What's a flower you would plant? A what? A geranium. Okay, so Joyce has her geranium garden here, okay, and she plants six geraniums. Are they bushes or flowers? Okay, they're flowers. Okay, and she plants them in her flower bed. She doesn't realize, though, that close to one that some dandelions started sprouting. Okay? And she has to go on a trip. And she leaves Larry in charge. Now, Larry likes golf a whole lot, too, right? So he's probably going to be hitting more balls out of the weeds than pulling weeds out of the garden, right? And you come back, and you're looking at your geranium. There are flowers again? Your flowers. you got four beautiful ones, but then you got two that their growth is stunted because those weeds sucked the nutrients away. You get what we're saying? Do you know the weeds in your life? Do you know those thorns? We all have them. We all have those things that want to limit our growth. But then there's the good soil. Then there's the soil that Jesus says, and he says it's good, not because it was purchased from a bag. He says it's good here in verse 23. The seed falls on the good soil, referring to one who hears the word and understands it. The implication there is that if you hear the word and you understand it, then you obey it, right? This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. The inference here is that we should desire to be people who are the good soil. Amen? Right? Have you ever heard a sermon when they were like, you need to be the path? You need to be so weathered and beaten down that nothing, nothing can get through your heart. We don't hear those sermons, right, or those teachings. Hopefully not. If you are, then you, this, we can set up a meeting, okay, a therapy session. We'll work through it. But we're never told that the rocks in our lives, we need to put more rocks in there so nothing can, can go deep. We're the same with the thorns. 
we're told that we need to be the good soil. The soil in which the Word of God can spring up and have a, a yield, a, a harvest, 160 or 30 times what was sown. I don't think that our problem with this passage has much to do with our truly understanding what Jesus means and what the desire is. I think that the problem that we have with this parable are some assumptions that we make. And I see these often. The first assumption that I see is that we like to look at this parable, especially those of us who have good church attendance. You know, I only miss about two or three Sundays contractually, you know, in my contract that I'm allowed to every year. So I'm here most of the Sundays, you know. And Wednesdays. I don't miss a lot of Wednesdays. Oh, and we tithe to the church or, or whatever. We are, we're the good soil already. So when we look at this parable, I get to be the sower. I get to be the one who lives my life and points out all of these soil conditions in other people's lives. If we're not careful, one of the things that I have seen in my time in ministry and in my life, I've grown up in the church for 39 years I've been around the church, is that it's very easy to slip into the mindset of us being the one who judges the soil in other people's lives. Oh yeah, I, sh- I told my neighbor that I was going to pray for them, and they didn't say thank you, so they must be the, the one that's got the rocks in their soil. Or whatever the circumstance is. What Jesus says here in this parable is that God is the sower and we are the field. God is the sower and we are the field. Can't you imagine that first audience that's coming and, and, and standing around Jesus? It's a large crowd that's gathered. We have the disciples that are there and, and he has this other, uh, Matthew says the disciples even have this private conversation about what parables are meant for. And, and Jesus says basically there are people who understand and there's people who don't understand. And these parables are being said in, the, in a way more than likely that the people who really seek to understand will, will seek and they'll see the layer deeper. But can't you imagine the people that are in the crowd who are the Pharisees and the Sadducees, those people who are holier than thou, who when Jesus starts speaking about this farmer, that they imagine that they are the ones who spread the seed. Sitting in this large crowd looking at Jesus on the boat, can't you imagine them being the ones that are looking around, saying, oh, there's some rocky folks down there. Oh, yeah, I know that they're the people who are weathered by the path. Up here behind me, let's not look at it. Don't make eye contact with them. They're the ones that got a lot of they got a lot of thorns in their lives. I've seen some of their thorns. See, Jesus again and again and again does not call his followers, does not teach his disciples, does not set the standard for us that in, in, in the spiritual life we should look anywhere else and judge, but at our own hearts and at our own minds. So that's the first assumption I see. The second assumption I see is that pretty much everybody assumes they're good soil. Right? Don't we just kind of make that assumption? We read this, oh, I'm the good soil. I heard the word of God. I understood the gospel. I accepted it. I walked the aisle. I got baptized. I got a certificate. I've done it. I'm the good soil. I mean, I, I mean I, I, I'm tempted to see it that way. Not necessarily from that point of view and saying that I'm the good soil standing up preaching to the rocks, the thorns, and the paths, okay? But when I was thinking about a way to teach this, I had this, I, I was thinking about taking the altar, pulling it back a little bit, the stuff on it, and then putting out, putting a brick, like a patio brick that would represent the path, okay? And then maybe get a jar of rock. We got some rocks beside our house, like filling up a jar with some rocks to show you what the rocks look like, and then trying to pick some fresh thorns and and stuff early this morning before church and then put it into a thing to show you that, and then get some of our nice potting soil and and scoop it up and uh, and, and put it in another thing. You you, you get the point? Then I I have some uh, some pigeon grain. I was just going to cast the grain out, and it was going to be fun and everything, but I was like, you know what? That would tempt us to think in ways that maybe we, we don't need to think about this parable. It could teach us to section off those parts of our lives. Because the thing is, back in Jesus' day, they couldn't go and just buy good soil. They had to work the soil and turn it into good soil. You tracking with me? Anybody ever done a garden? 
Okay? It just popped up on our timeline this past week. Three years ago, we set out in our backyard to do a garden. I didn't think I was ambitious at the time. I sectioned off a 20 foot by 20 foot, foot little plot in the corner. Let me tell you, 20 foot by 20 foot is a lot of space when it comes to trying to break the ground up. Trying to get some, some, you know, put some Roundup on, which is, I'm sure we put something bad to our bodies, what we ate out of there, but put the Roundup on and kill the grass a week or two ahead, and then come with the hoe, and you're just chopping and chopping and chopping and chopping, and then realize that this ain't going to work. And um, then, uh, thankfully, one of our, our neighbors had a tiller, so I'm out there tilling, doing my, doing my thing and breaking it up. And then we get three or four inches under, and guess what? Big old rocks, okay, stones. Stones, and then we had the added, the added layer of the hazard of every time Luke saw a worm diving for it, some swinging the hoe and them trying not to chop his little fingers off. You know, it took a long, long, long time to work that soil to turn it into good soil. And guess what? After it turned into good soil, it took more work to keep it as good soil. You know, how, how crazy would it be if we could go back a couple thousand years and take a pot like, you know, if, if we had a time machine, there'd probably be other things we want to take back in 2,000 years, but let's just say one day we're like, hey, I'm going to go back to when you know, Jesus was teaching this parable and, uh, and show people some good soil. And so we go to Lowe's and we get the vegetable and herb garden soil and we throw it over and we go into the time machine and we go back. And we open the bag and they look in and they see the good soil. It would be so foreign to them. Because for them, they, they knew that to develop and to attain good soil, you had to work the earth. Let me tell you this morning how this applies to us. We are not good soil. We don't start out as good soil. Even when we accept Jesus and understand and hear the word, God continues to show us things that we need to, 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 to pull out of the soil, to purify the soil. Colossians 3, verse 1 through 17 says it so well. I love this passage of Scripture. Paul says, Since you have been raised with Christ and got your insurance from hell for eternity, do whatever you want, whenever you want. Okay, he doesn't say that, okay? That was, the, that was the amplified, errant version of the Bible, okay? Paul doesn't say to go to church, hear the gospel, get baptized, and just do whatever you want for the rest of your life. He says, since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these things in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things. Anger, rage, malice, slander... Filthy language. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge, in, in knowledge in the image of its creator. You notice Paul doesn't say that, bam, you're good soil. He says you need to keep, you need to keep working to pull these things out of your lives. Rid yourself of these things. Things, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire. Pull those things out. Pull those stones out. T till up that ground. If your heart is so hard in this area, open up to somebody. Go get counseling. Go get therapy. Read the scriptures and obey them. Do, do, do whatever it takes. Get, get this soil so that it can be worked and so that it can have life and so that you can thrive. He says, here there is no Gentile or Jew or circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. Have you ever noticed trying to rid yourself of a sin in your life? 
It always finds its way back if you don't replace it with something. You ever noticed that before? I want you to notice what Paul says here. He says to them, rid yourselves of these things, but clothe yourselves with this, with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another. If any of you have, has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. Y'all know this one. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So I don't know where you're at this morning, but I do know there's no perfect soil. There's no field that is perfect. There's, no, there, there's none of us who doesn't have a beaten down place, a rock in our life, a dandelion trying to grow up. There's not one of us who doesn't need to keep tending the soil that is our hearts, that is our soul. I, I tell you every week, God has purpose in our lives. God has purpose continually in our church, and His work is never done. So let us pray. God, we thank You so much for Your work among us. God, we thank You for the ways that You are, are breaking up the hard places in our hearts, the ways that You are, are taking our routines and habits, and You are asking us to inspect those and to change them. God, the way that, you are, that, that, deceitful, that the deceitfulness of wealth permeates our souls, that You're asking us to acknowledge and to live differently. The cares of this world have their importance, but they're not more important than you. Lord, I believe we all seek to be the good soil. We all seek to be the soil that, 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 has a, 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 that produces a crop, that produces 160 or 30 what was sown in it. But God, let us not underestimate the hard work that it is drawing close to you of staying close to you, of setting aside those times during our day that we're going to shut down everything else but our relationship with you. God, give us courage to be the kind of people who are the good soil and who produce a harvest. In Jesus' holy name we ask. Amen. This morning, if the Lord is... Stirring in your heart and in your soul and you want to make any sort of public declaration, um, perhaps accepting Christ as your Savior, uh, maybe uh, coming this morning to become a member of our church, or perhaps you want to come and pray in any other way, I'll be here to receive you. Additionally, if you want to come to the altar and to pray, I welcome you. Let us stand now as we sing hymn number 602, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus.
Once again, thank you for coming and being part of this time of worship today. Surely God is pleased as we lift His name, as we worship Him, as we sing of His grace and goodness, His love and His mercy. I hope that today you've been challenged in some way as this parable has been challenging me. Um, I, I remember John's going to give me a hard time if I don't share. He's going to say I left him hanging on my story. Yesterday I spent a whole day outside working the hedges. All right, we got some big old hedges that grow and they get real tall and, and a, a lot of a lot of uh, trimming and shrub work yesterday and, and such. And so um, it does take energy. It takes time. The spiritual life takes that right. As we see this parable, to work the soil. And so I just want to encourage you um, in your endeavors and as you reflect and as you pray and as you ask God to show you where the next steps are in your life. Um, I believe revival's coming for our community, not just our church, but in this whole community. The Lord is at work in wonderful ways. Uh, we saw that last Sunday, and um, I, I'm so excited about it, and um, I hope you are too. So. Let us, uh, God, give you thanks and glory and praise for all things that you're continuing to do in our midst. And uh, Lord, we thank you uh, that you look on us and you just, you love us so good. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May you go in peace. Amen.